Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Anthony Chow, the director of San Jose State's High School, uh, and we appreciate you joining us uh, for our celebration and recognition of Pride Month. The theme of our symposium is how LGBTQIA plus librarians shape libraries today. And this is a part of our new EDI series sponsored by the SJSUI School. As an Asian American growing up in the deep South, I was visually and obviously different from everyone. Only two APIs in the entire school. As someone who has experienced discrimination um, throughout my life, uh, and also seeing it occur with my three children as well, I am committed to trying to do something and make a difference. This is done through education and authentic understanding, at least certainly one of the primary ways, uh, and, and really focusing on the fact that we are much more similar than we are different. As a father of a non-binary child, I have a close connection to the LGBTQI plus movement, and celebrate and, and I'm proud of our diversity, our differences, and our shared dreams and aspirations. It's important for her to know she is not alone, and that we respect and accept her journey to be more of who she is meant to be. I'm sincerely grateful to our distinguished guests that are here with us today. Uh, and we will start with a keynote address uh, followed by a panel discussion from our impressive panel. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, our keynote speaker, Dr. Shannon Altman. Dr. Shannon, uh, Dr. Altman is an associate professor in the School of Information Science at the University of Kentucky. She obtained her uh, doctorate from Indiana University. Her research interests include information ethics, censorship, intellectual freedom, information policy, public libraries, privacy, and quality, qualitative research methods. Dr. Altman is a past editor of the Journal of Intellectual Freedom and Privacy and associate editor of Library Quarterly. She recently published a book, Practicing Intellectual Freedom in Libraries. So join me in welcoming Dr. Shannon Altman. Shannon. Hello, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna to start sharing my screen um, as I have some slides. Um, and today I'll be talking about LGBTQ plus resources in your library as part of the symposium. Um, as Dr. Chow graciously introduced uh, me, I'm an associate professor in library science at the University of Kentucky. Um, some of my main areas of focus for teaching and research are intellectual freedom and censorship. And this includes uh, a focus on LGBTQ resources in particular. I've been married to my wife for five and a half years. And this summer we're going to celebrate uh, 10 years since our first date. Um, we also have a dog, Riley, that is on the screen now. Um, he's part dachshund, part cocker spaniel, we think. And he's, he's a mess, but he's a rescue dog and we love him. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And I'll start out with a little background about myself. I was one of those kids who went to the library all the time. I would check out a stack of books uh, and then return a week later, sometimes just a few days later and get another stack of books. And this continued through my teenage years. Now, until I went to college, I only read one book with a queer character. Um, this was a book from the adult section that I picked up because it had an interesting cover. The main thing I remember is that the lesbian in it died. And uh, my mother was a little uncomfortable with my reading material, but she had a philosophy of um, sort of an open doors. So she just let me read what I wanted and we discussed if I had any questions. At the same time in my early twenties, the only lesbian that I really knew of was Ellen DeGeneres. Um, and she was fired after she came out on her TV show. So that was not the best role model for me at the time when I was trying to figure out my own identity and coming out myself. Because of these things, I really had um, some discomfort and shame about being part of the LGBT community throughout my 20s. It was an uncomfortable period for sure. And I have to say, unfortunately, the library was not a, a great resource to me during that time. But then something happened. I was living in Oklahoma at this time, and this children's book, King and King, caused a huge controversy. Uh, if you're not familiar with this book, 
It's the story of a prince who was told by his mother, the queen, that he must select a marriage mate. One princess after another comes through and none are really appealing to him until he catches the eye of a brother of a princess and the two princes fall in love and become king and king. Well, many people thought the public library should not carry this book. Uh, they were outraged. In fact, the legislators in Oklahoma proposed that libraries should start having a special roped off section, literally a quarter of the library with rope around it uh, for controversial materials such as LBTG Q materials. Sorry about that. Um, and kids would not be allowed in this roped off section. It was for parents only. Thankfully, libraries did not go that route, but they compromised by having a special family talk session that was for adults only, and that's where many of these children's books were relocated. Throughout this controversy, I had a lot of feelings, but I kept coming back to these questions. Is this what libraries do? They create special sections where kids can't go? Is, is this the best way to handle this sort of material? Is this right? I just wondered, why can't LGBTQ plus content be just considered normal and non-controversial? Why can't it be shelved with everything else? And inevitably, if we start taking things off shelves, we're gonna end up with a library like this. The librarian says, we had to take out the books that were too religious or not religious enough. And as you can see, the child's left with nothing to read. Down in the corner, a stick figure says, what about my reading skills? And the reply is, those would only get you into trouble. I thought a lot about this, both in context of the book King and King and in context of books in general. And I was really disturbed by this because up till now, my experience of libraries had been one of a, an open welcoming space where I was always able to, free, able to check out whatever books interested me. So I went to graduate school. I learned about libraries and intellectual freedom. I earned my doctorate at Indiana University, as Dr. Chow said. And I continued studying issues of censorship and intellectual freedom in all sorts of situations, but especially in libraries. Um, LGBTQ plus resources have been a special focus of mine. And this is really an intersection of personal and professional interests, as you'll see throughout this presentation. So with that background, let me dive into the meat of my talk. We'll kind of cover three areas here. We'll talk about the significance of having LGBTQ plus resources in your library. We'll talk about ways to incorporate um, a more inclusive approach to LGBTQ resources. And we'll talk about the occasional challenges of having queer friendly resources in your library. So one of the most significant, significant aspects of having LGBTQ resources has to do with um, validating and empowering people. So kids and teens who are LGBTQ experience a significantly higher rate of bullying than straight kids do. Some research says it's two and a quarter times more likely that an LGBTQ kid or teen will be bullied. But the research also shows us that people for, feel more resilient when they have access to LGBTQ plus resources. They also feel safer when they can access these resources when they're in a place that has these resources. And this research isn't specific to libraries, but it's definitely applicable to libraries. I think many of us can relate that it's validating and empowering to see stories or read stories of people like ourselves. This is a picture of the character Alex from Supergirl. She came out in a story arc and many people have been identifying with her and her story has resonated with people. So that's just an example of 
how it can be empowering to see stories of people like ourselves. Another reason that it's important to have LGBTQ plus resources is because queer individuals live in every part of the United States, according to census data. Nearly 6 million people have an LGBT parent in the US. And 21% of Generation Z, that's those 10 to mid 20s, 21% um, of that generation identifies as part of the LGBTQ plus community. In fact, I just read a statistic that there are more queer individuals in the United States than there are children under the age of 18. So this is a significant part of your population, no matter where you live. Finally, it's also worth noting that Straight people benefit when LGBTQ plus resources are in a library. When people are able to see something represented, it creates better understanding. And that creates an important shift in the social consciousness and better includes people from a range of different backgrounds. I also wanna note that as a foundation of librarianship, libraries should be welcome and opening, open to all. Um, this is sort of a key premise of all types of librarianship. And it's something that we should keep in mind as we work to know our communities. And this sort of has two senses to me. In the first sense, we should know our community in a general way. Um, is it made up of mostly senior citizens, young folks, people of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds? What's the socioeconomic status of folks? What's the education range represented in your community? So we should have a deep and thorough understanding of our community on many different aspects. But this phrase is also relevant to the LGBTQ plus community specifically. We need to know the queer community um, in our local area, what would work for them, what would serve them, what would help them. And to do this, we really need to reach out and make connections with folks. So let's get to some nitty gritty. Let's talk about how to have more inclusive policies in the library. And I'm starting here with policies because this is really the bedrock upon which other inclusive, inclusivity and diversity uh, focuses are built. If you don't have inclusive policies, then the rest of your inclusivity efforts will not be as successful. So the starting place is to respect all people and treat all people with kindness. This includes people who don't look like you, of course, people who don't sound like you, uh, people who may dress a little unusually or seem a little weird. Um, and I use those phrases in quotation marks. Um, but all people, regardless of where they're coming from, should be uh, welcomed with respect and kindness in a library. And this includes, of course, using people's correct pronouns. We also need to think about policies that affect, affect dress, mannerisms, or behavior. A lot of libraries have policies that uh, prohibit certain behaviors, certain types of, or restrict certain types of dress. We need to be really thoughtful here and think about if this um, negatively affects certain parts of our community. In the case of today's symposium, LGBTQ plus community. For example, if a library has a dress code it says women must wear skirts or men must wear long pants. That could be exclusionary for some folks, both the focus on gender and the focus on gender specific clothing. So this is just a simple example of how we need to be more thoughtful when it comes to policies around dress, mannerisms and behavior. Ideally, libraries should offer health insurance that encompasses um, same sex partners or spouses. And even better if it covers um, medical transitioning or 
anything along those lines, um, but inclusive health policies, health insurance should be sought out. Libraries should have bathrooms that are gender neutral and or single stall bathrooms. Sometimes this can be um, promoted as a way to uh, accommodate families as well. Um, single stall restrooms can also be more accessible for those with disabilities. So actually a wide range of your community is served by having single stall gender neutral bathrooms. Another simple policy to implement is to avoid asking for gender on forms, like when someone signs up for a new library card or when someone is applying to work at the library. Rarely is gender relevant or necessary in these cases. Finally, as a policy, the library should stand up for LGBTQ resources and programming. And we'll get back to this in a few minutes. So let's move on to inclusive programming. In this sense, libraries should be intentionally inclusive and intersectional from the beginning. So I've heard of libraries that have a story time focused on dads and daughters. And this may initially sound promising as a way to connect these demographic groups, get more father figures involved in story time, but it's also exclusionary language. It's focusing on a male identified parental figure and it leaves out a lot of families who might have uh, lesbian parents, who might have gender non-binary or queer parents, who might be single mothers. Um, and it also really focuses on the gender identity of the child as well. So perhaps there's a different way we can rephrase this different um, approach to be more inclusionary rather than exclusionary. In addition, using the phrase boys and girls in story time, for instance, or in other types of programming, um, that can feel exclusionary to many individuals. Um, using phrases like, are y'all ready for story time? Or friends, let's settle down and get ready to do the craft. There are a number of ways to approach this in a more inclusionary top sort of way. You just have to be really intentional with your language. It's also really valuable for libraries to partner with LGBTQ organizations and community members. Um, this can involve national organizations, but I'm specifically thinking about one's local organizations and individuals in this case. Um, and there are a couple of benefits here. If you partner with local communities and organizations, you can find out what would be useful and relevant to them, what they would like to see in the library. Um, you can also help invite them to co-host a programming event. Um, doesn't need to be, it could be something like Drag Queen Storytime, although it doesn't need to be. It could be something like um, Lesbian History Month. And speaking of inclusive programming and that sort of celebration of identity, um, here's a timeline of a number of events and special days that are relevant to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, whether it's International Transgender Day of Visibility, GLBT Book Month, National Coming Out Day, you can see there are actually um, events spread throughout the calendar year. Now, again, this is where it's valuable to know your community, talk to your community to see what they would find valuable and helpful. Um, for example, on National Coming Out Day, would they want a celebration of coming out, a celebration of stories, a celebration of themselves, or would they think that something like that was more explanatory for the broader community would be useful. Here, you don't wanna make assumptions, but you really wanna to talk to your community members. You can also have an inclusive approach to reference services. 
And this starts by not making assumptions. Um, you don't want to make assumptions about whether a person who is approaching you is part of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, there could be any number of reasons for asking about certain materials. Maybe an individual is in the closet and seeking to come out um, or thinking about it and wants materials along those lines. Maybe the person is an ally and is um, seeking information to help a friend or family member. There can be any number of reasons that individuals seek di different reading materials and we shouldn't make assumptions about what those reasons are. Um, another way to have more inclusive reference is to include LGBTQ plus resources in reference responses. For example, if someone comes to the reference desk and asks about uh, recent thrillers, you could um, suggest examples that include straight characters and queer characters. Um, this is a simple way to incorporate these resources into the broader library happening. You don't have to wait to reference LGBTQ plus resources only when somebody asks about that specific community, but you can treat it as part of the broader library resources. We also need to think about inclusivity and in how we address patrons. Um, this, again, mean, may mean not calling people sir or ma'am. Maybe we should ask for their names or ask how they identify and then use that information rather than making um, assumptions about gender. So a lot of this boils down to being intentional and thoughtful. And as a slide said a few, a few uh, minutes ago, treating everybody with respect and kindness. Finally, um, some ways to be inclusive of LGBTQ resources. One approach is to look at collection development policies. Um, this includes looking at the sources that you use to um, select your books. Are you looking at only the big three or four publishers? Um, what about small presses, independent presses? Um, are you relying on the top two or three uh, review journals like Kirkus Reviews, Booklist, et cetera? Um, maybe looking at some alternative sources that might review some lesser known titles would be valuable. There are some presses that are dedicated to just queer literature, queer uh, materials. So those might be worth looking at as well. We should also be really thoughtful about lab labeling and cataloging in our libraries. By labeling, I mean putting an LGBTQ sticker on the spine of a book um, or creating a special queer section in the library. This can be inadvertently problematic for many library users. Perhaps someone doesn't want others to know they are reading books with LGBTQ characters or themes. Perhaps someone um, may not pick up a book that's labeled as queer, even though they would like it if they actually read it. Likewise, creating a separate section for queer resources, queer literature, um, kind of calls back to the roped off section of problematic literature that the Oklahoma legislators were thinking of. Um, cataloging can also be problematic. Some subject heading terms are pretty outdated, even offensive. And um, many books with LGBTQ plus characters don't include that information in the subject headings in the record. So we need to be uh, thoughtful about how we go about cataloging these and because that of course affects what will come up in searches and what we might recommend to our readers. I also encourage libraries to buy LGBTQ plus books that have won awards. Uh, these days there are several awards specific to LGBTQ plus books. And uh, this can be a good indicator of quality. And it can also 
be a buttress in case these materials get challenged. This includes teen books and children's books that have won awards. It's also really valuable to buy health information that's specific to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, they often, folks in this community often struggle to find meaningful, accurate, inclusive health information. Um, so having some of that in the library could create a really valuable resource. It can also be really valuable to include to create inclusive book displays and promotions. Um, I have here a picture that a colleague and a friend sent me. She was very excited about creating a um, display for Valentine's Day for the month of February about love letters. It's not the best cropped picture, but you can see at the top a mailbox with some letters spilling out and around the bottom inside is uh, our number of books related to the theme of love letters. Now, my question here is, are all the books about straight characters? Are there any queer romances included? This is just an easy example of how you can incorporate LGBTQ plus resources into any display, any sort of um, promotion of books and materials to your library users. Um, you can think about um, when you show books, do you have some of the outward facing books that are LGBTQ plus? Um, don't relegate these books just to um, Pride Month, but include them year round in all of your displays. However, I do want to warn you that sometimes doing so can create challenges. In the past year, the American Library Association received reports of 729 challenges to library materials and services. And now up to 90% of challenges go unreported. So the actual number of challenges in 2021 may have been closer to 1400. Um, but this number of 729 in 2021 is the highest number of reported challenges that the ALA has ever received. It's more than four fourfold increase over the previous year. Of the top 10 most challenged books in 2021, half of them were challenged due to queer content. And in addition to books, there have also been challenges to displays, programming, even databases. So, there seems to be a rise in challenges to materials. And this is something to really be aware of. The most common reasons for challenges in the past few years, according to the ALA, has have to do with LGBTQ plus content, characters and authors that are black, indigenous, or people of color, and anti-racism themes. The bottom line is that these are materials that counter traditional narratives about marginalized communities, such as a happy queer black couple. Uh, these are not narratives that have been common in the past and there's more and more work coming out um, about these characters with these themes, with these authors. This work is being highlighted in new ways. And as a result, um, some people get really angry. Stories about happy queer individuals and families really anger some people. And having more depictions of this community, having more inclusiveness upsets people. It challenges their worldview. I'm sure some of us can relate to having our worldview challenged and it can create a lot of feelings of confusion, frustration, uncertainty, anger. People don't like those feelings. They don't like having their worldview challenged. So sometimes they lash out at the library. How to respond is fairly straightforward. First of all, you have to keep your cool. Listen with patience and respect. This is someone after all who cares about what's in the library. They have strong feelings about what the library should contain, even if those feelings are very different from you, from your feelings. 
maybe it's possible to find some common ground about the importance of a library, the importance of children reading, for example. Um, we should avoid confrontational reaction, responding to the emotions that somebody else brings to the table. If you're not a supervisor or director, you should get your supervisor. Um, they have a little more training oftentimes on how to deal with these sorts of situations. Let the ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom know about the challenge. Um, you can email an individual who works in the office or you can go online and there are contacts, information about how to share your challenge with them. And you should offer the patron a reconsideration or a challenge form, which means you need to have a reconsideration or challenge form. A reconsideration form provides a formal mechanism to evaluate challenges to materials. The ALA website has a good example and really useful information about how to craft a reconsideration form. If you have a board of trustees, you should get your reconsideration form approved by them, should be part of the official policies of the library. Once you have a reconsideration form and you've shared it with the patron, then you need to follow your reconsideration policy, which means you need a reconsideration policy. This is basically explains the process, how, to, how you, the library, are going to handle challenges or requests for reconsideration. The first step is to form a committee to evaluate the work in question. This committee can contain library members, board members. Some libraries include community members. There are pros and cons to that. So, the structure of the committee should be outlined in your reconsideration policy. So you have a guideline to follow. Um, this committee should carefully read the, the book, watch the movie, whatever the material is, whatever the challenged material is, carefully review it. Uh, they should also review the Library Bill of Rights, the ALA Code of Ethics, other professional guidance in the literature. There's a freedom to read statement, a freedom to view statement. There's statements specific about minors access to information, LGBTQ plus content in the library. There's a lot of guidance out there. So we should all be reviewing that when we get a challenge. Then the committee comes together, debates the merits. Oh, they should also be reviewing um, any professional reviews or evaluations of the material. For example, if the book was reviewed in the professional literature, if the movie was on the, was reviewed, if the material made the New York Times bestseller list, things like that are also important to take into consideration. And then the committee should meet and make a decision and then share that with the patron in question. It's often useful to have an appeals process if the patron feels they weren't heard, a, another step in the process can um, be useful. And another piece of advice is to set a time frame for challenges. Uh, maybe you'll review a work once every three years. That way, if, if somebody is unhappy about a material, a particular book, say, you don't get continual challenges to that book every month and have to review it every month for you know, the next two years. But if you say, we're gonna review material once and that um, decision will stand for three years, that gives your committee some breathing room. Throughout this process, the goals are to be fair, respectful, and consistent with all patrons. Um, you want to create a neutral policy that you would act in the same way for every patron, regardless of what their concern is. You also want to be respectful. Um, even if you disagree with this patron, even if they're upset, saying unkind things about the library, they are a library patron. So you want to be respectful and consistent with them. You also want to provide relevant feedback and information. Um, some people 
some library directors in their letter to a challenger might tie the library decision to the First Amendment, um, the Freedom to Read Statement, the Library Bill of Rights, giving relevant information to put a decision in better context. Um, throughout the reconsideration process, one of the goals should also be to protect the diversity of resources in your library. This helps bolster the diversity of your community and support your community as a whole. Again, remember that LGBTQ plus individuals are found in every community across the United States. Now, I haven't come out and said this before in my talk, but I want to make this point really clear. LGBTQ plus individuals, the community in general, are not responsible for inclusivity and making these changes in the library. It's responsibility of everyone who works in the library, especially the leaders in the administration. Doing so really goes back to the key values of librarianship. Uh, some of the core values of librarianship, according to the American Library Association, include access, equity, intellectual freedom, and diversity. These are core foundational concepts, and they really should be the basis of how we implement inclusivity in our library, how we incorporate the LGBTQ plus community in our libraries. I'll wrap up with a few final points. Um, we need to be really intentional about inclusion. I hope that has come through in my talk today. Um, from policies, programming, reference, resources, all of these aspects of librarianship, we need to be really thoughtful and intentional about how we are including diverse patrons and diverse library staff into our libraries. And inclusion matters. It can be life-changing for many folks. It's a valuable, worthwhile goal. It has a lot of importance for your community and for particular individuals in your community. I hope I've also shown that libraries can promote and enhance inclusivity through specific actions. Buying a few LGBTQ books is not going to be not going to be sufficient, but taking specific acts further and really starting at the bedrock of inclusive policies, you can promote and enhance inclusivity, especially for the LGBTQ plus community. Finally, I'll note that sometimes it does take some courage to be a librarian. Sometimes you have to stand up to people who might not want happy, meaningful, relevant information about the LGBTQ plus community. Um, sometimes you have to stand up for the resources in your library, but that courage is really worth it. Um, you get the joy of knowing that you've made a difference in people's lives, even if you don't see it. Having an inclusive library, having LGBTQ resources and policies, programming and re reference, those can change people's lives. And you get the joy of bringing something new to your community, enhancing their worldview. I've included here my contact information, um, email and Twitter. I'm also really easy to find online if you just Google my name. And I'm always happy to continue this conversation, answer questions, um, I've spoken to the Library Board of Trustees. I've done training with library administration. I'm happy to do any of that, but I'm also happy to take any questions now and have a discussion. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, thank you for your personal stories and perspective around your own journey, obviously, your expertise. Libraries truly have need to support LGBTQ plus uh, across uh, the spectrum of what we consider our normal day-to-day. -day. Also, I really appreciate your, your points about challenging others' worldviews, uh, which is, is, is truly, uh, again, a core. And I, uh, I also like the point that you make about it is really all of our responsibility, uh, especially those in leadership, uh, intentionality, right? And then finally, courage. Uh, so, um, DEI as applied has become a core component of all ALA accreditation standards. And so I think uh, all of what you said, Shannon, is very
timely. Now we do have um, some questions for you. So, okay, seven questions, but we'll see. We'll see if we can uh, work through them. So you'll also see them, Shannon, in the Q and A. Uh, but let me, I guess, to start at the top here. Um, what are your thoughts on lab labeling stickering uh, for LGBTQ plus books as a way to help folks find them in the collection? Yeah, I am a little hesitant about labeling, to be honest, for two reasons. One, it can turn some people away. Um, imagine a uh, straight middle-aged white woman looking for romance books. She might not pick up a book that has an LGBTQ sticker on it, a rainbow sticker on it because she thinks it's not relevant to her. She, she assumes she wouldn't enjoy it. However, if it didn't have that sticker, she might pick it up and really like it. So it can act as a deterrent to some folks. The second reason I'm hesitant about it is because it can um, act as a signal that a particular individual is reading queer books and that could be problematic for that, for that individual. People might make assumptions about that individual, which could be problematic. So um, I understand the, the impulse, right? But I'm not sure this is the best way to go about it. Great point. Um, and everyone feel free to use the chat as you want to comment or continue interacting with Janet and the panel. Uh, so the second question is from uh, Anonymous. You mentioned avoiding asking for gender of the gender of patrons or job applicants. Should we also avoid asking for pronouns? Hmm, that's a difficult question. I think asking for pronouns could be useful. Um, that allows the person to identify how, explain how they wish to be identified. A lot of times I've seen forms that say, you know, check male or female. And that's the sort of thing that I'm particularly opposed to. Um, you could put something like pronouns, op, you know, optional in parentheses. That way, if somebody does not want to identify themselves, they don't have to. Um, but that gives that empowers the individual filling out the form to um, explain how they are best um, identified and uh, spoken about. Yeah, great point. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Braith uh, Birchall. Um, I work in a, oh, I apologize, actually Amanda Proper. Um, I work in an archive, so not active in public the public library scene. So I'm curious to know about specific LGBTQ plus programming and how it would differ from traditional programming. Sure, that's a great question. Um, there's a couple of different ways this could go. One could be something um, like the, um, for like Harvey Milk Day, one could be something that is more explanatory. Who is Harvey Milk? What does he represent? Why do we celebrate Harvey Milk Day? And that would be informative for both the LGBTQ plus community, but also uh, members, people who are not members of that community. Um, and it might even be a little bit more for straight me members of your community so that they can get some insight and perspective on the queer community. Um, or you could have something that is really targeted and specific for um, LGBTQ plus individuals and communities. Um, something that, um, for example, um, during LGBTQ History Month, maybe they, maybe you invite community members who are LGBTQ plus to come to your library and share stories about their history, share stories about the history of the queer community and create this bonding experience and safe place for them. Um, so those are different types of examples. Perhaps the most controversial example right now is Drag Queen Storytime, which many public libraries and other institutions are doing. Um, this is often positioned as sort of a bridge between these two types. It's um, very a, a very welcoming place for queer families, but it also, um, is a great place for allies and other members of your community to show up and learn about and support the LGBTQ community. Great, thank you, Shannon. Um, we'll, we'll have time for one more question. And then I think what we'll do is maybe have you feel free to interact with those questions through Q&A where you can actually answer them uh, via, via chat. Um, 
So the, the, the next question in line is uh, from Braith uh, Virchow. So do you have any ideas about gender neutral, respectful terms like ma'am or sir? I've heard it be very important to some people to be referred to in these ways, but as a non-binary person myself, I always want to avoid assuming a person's gender. Yeah, this is one that our society, I don't think, is quite solved yet, unfortunately. Um, my preference is for y'all um, or to just ask somebody who comes up to the reference desk, thanks for that question. Um, may I ask your name? Um, okay, Robert or Tammy or whatever the, the answer may be, and then use that as a springboard into the conversation that happens at a reference desk. Um, so those are two approaches. I'll agree they're not 100% replacements for sir and ma'am, but like I said, I, I think our society is still working on this puzzle. Yeah, and I, I, can, I can see uh, Shannon and I's uh, southern roots. Y'all is something that we're used to, so um, very nice. Uh, all right, so what I would recommend, uh, Shannon, if you're okay with it, is um, I think Alfredo is helping you move the questions to being answered. So feel free to work through that list if you like as we begin the panel discussion. Um, and also feel free to drop question and answers into the chat uh, if you like uh, as well. So yes, I was born and raised in, in Florida. So um, y'all is, is definitely part of that. Okay, so let's introduce our uh, prestigious um, panel here. So we are gonna be talking um, to the panel about how AG, uh, LGBTQIA plus librarians shape libraries today. Uh, and so with us, we have Melinda Ann Borey, uh, collection development librarian from the Floyd County Library. Good to see you, Melinda. Um, we have Martin Garner, uh, library director at the Robert Frost Library and First College. We have uh, Cassian Rye Lemke, uh, Papillion, Papillion Li Public Library and University of Nebraska at Omaha's Archives and Special Collections. And then finally, we have Zoe uh, Zeigler, uh, Louisiana Trans Oral History Project. And if I mispronounce anyone's names, I apologize in advance. Uh, but we um, uh, welcome and we appreciate everybody's time. Uh, and let's go ahead and start with the first question. So the first question, um, and it's really open to, to anyone and everyone, um, what does Pride Month mean to you? And why is it important to recognize and celebrate? Just feel free to jump right in. Yeah. Okay, I have an answer for this one. Um, I, I think that uh, even in today's society that there is a lot of pressure on queer people all over the country to uh, be ashamed of the ways in which they are different, in the ways that they exist in the world. And so pride in that context is an act of resistance that is an act of community. And it, it is a way for us to push back against the ways that we're oppressed. Thank you, Melinda. Yeah, and, and I'll just jump in and, and build a little bit on what, what you said, Melinda, which I, I completely agree with. And I would just also add that it's still very much, and Shannon, this goes back to what you were saying with the challenges of the programming. It's still very, very, very important for us to have examples of ourselves and each other. Um, we know, so uh, I work with the Louisiana Trans Oral History Project, and one of the things that we're trying to do is build those examples because we know lack of examples actually kills us. So the importance of pride, especially from a library angle, is, is is that I think, and that's why it, it, people get angry about it. They've always been angry when we didn't want to die. Yeah, thank you, Sophie. Yeah, and I think really that idea of community and, and not being alone is, is so critical to to celebrating. Right, and that's being asked for all PDI symposiums and heritage months. Why why do we just celebrate it that month? I think that's one of them. Right, it's just to stand together for a brief period of time. Um. Any other thoughts from the panel? Yeah, I uh, actually have um, a bookmark with a quote from the LGBT Iowa archives that's proximity to our history is empowering. And I think that for building community, we can build community contemporarily, but I think we also are trying to build community throughout time, um, which is where I'm excited about our archives folks who are participating. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. 
Okay. Um, why don't we move on to the uh, second uh, prompt here? So in today's society, uh, what do you feel are the primary challenges being faced by the LGBTQI plus community? Uh, I don't I don't mind jumping in for this one. Um, so I have, <laughs> I have a lot of strong feelings about this. I think um, one of the uh, the first thing that I think about, of course, is the state level legislation that's coming through um, with the majority of, of the states right now. Again, I'm in Louisiana. Things are not as bad here, believe it or not, as they, as they are in a lot of our southern neighbors. But um, rights are being taken away at just sort of ridiculous um, sort of angles, right? It's just chipping away at, at everything seemingly all at once. And, but we know, right, that anytime one group is attacked, it's always just practice for the next group. So this is, I think, uh, the biggest challenge that we face, but also I think the biggest moment for solidarity, not only among the LGBTQ plus community, but we know that this is, this is also racial based and gender based. Um, and I think just a wonderful opportunity for us all to come together. But I feel like this is the biggest challenge that we have right now. Um, we, we are identified as a group that is still okay to legislate against. That's a great point, Sophie. Martin? To, to follow up on what Sophie was saying, I think that just the shift in, in the rhetoric where suddenly we're all groomers um, has been a really unfortunately effective way to revive the culture war that has never gone away, but now uh, it's, it's another way of calling us pedophiles, which is what they used to say, and then that became unacceptable, and now it's acceptable again. And I think that that's where legislators are getting their your sense of political cover for trying to move forward all the laws that, that you reference. Um, but there's just, you know, we, we now have to dismantle that, that concept that no, we're, we're not groomers. Um, we're just trying to make space for people to know that it's okay to be alive as themselves. Um, and uh, so we have to fight the battle uh, around language before we can even uh, start to push back about some of the other some of the other issues. So I think that's another aspect that's really troubling to me right now. As Shannon noted, there are LGBTQ plus people in every region and in every region of our country and the world at large, even the most progressive areas, there are families, there are healthcare providers who are not affirming to those queer people. So, you know, we have people in our communities who are not safe in their own homes. We have people who are not able to access the healthcare that they need. And uh, recently with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, um, we're seeing, you know, some glimmers of what precedent might be coming for queer specific legislation uh, down the line. So, I mean, the, the threats are very real and they are pervasive and they're really going to touch on potentially every part of life. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to kind of pivot uh, to you know, you know, Shannon, your, your point about over half of the uh, book challenges uh, have to deal with some type of LGBTQI plus content. Um, can you, do you see this as a potential opportunity as well for libraries to change even more worldviews? Yeah, I do. I think um, that is slowly happening, but I think that can continue to happen through how libraries um, interact with their communities. Um, you know, we often say that parents have the right to decide what their kid reads, but not, not the right to decide what all kids read. So I think one way we can further advance that, that approach is to say, you know, if your child reads something that makes you uncomfortable, um, you can always come to the library for more resources. You can always um, talk to a librarian for more information. Um, and I think, again, I think having these resources, but also incorporating them as part of the broader library um, picture is really important. So not saving them just for Pride Month, but incorporating them all year round. That's great. Uh, and everyone, we have plenty of time, so feel free to uh, uh, chime in, if you will. Um, uh, appreciate Shannon uh, giving us uh, quite a bit of time. Um, <clears throat> so let's let's talk a little bit more about um, what role do you feel libraries should play in, in supporting the members of the LGBTQ 
LGBTQI plus community. We've really, as I always mention at these symposiums, that uh, likely the majority of our attendees are are uh, uh, like the LS professionals, uh, many of which would not are not part of this community. So how can they best help? What can they best do? How can they, Shannon, be more intentional uh, in their in their uh, in their library spaces? This is there everyone. So. I think a really easy move that people can do is to be advocates just in their everyday interactions. Um, I think that sometimes queer folks and folks of different experiences are forced to be advocates, whether we want to or not. And I've definitely been in that experience in the library. So if you aren't a queer person or a trans person, I think you have ample opportunity to learn about how to be a great advocate. And I think that even those really small interactions in the day to day make a difference. If anything, it shows your colleagues that you're um, willing to support them. Um, I think that's something that's really easy. It doesn't take a lot of structural power just to be better armed for those interactions. Great point. I think probably a lot of us have are familiar with uh, Dr. Redeen Sims Bishop's uh, concept of windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors for anyone who's not. Um, it or is an idea that originated specifically in children's literature, but I, I think that it's more widely applicable to a lot of the products and services um, that we have available at in the modern library, uh, where it can be a window into a life that is different from yours. It can be a mirror. Uh, to an experience that maybe you didn't realize was not just your experience uh, or a sliding glass door, which is, you know, a, a mirror that could turn into or a window that could turn into a, a door into a new experience that maybe you were unaware was a possibility prior to now. That's a great point. And I think that that is a critical You know, I think one thing that you know, I'm seeing in, in the chat and suggestions about making sure that we've got programming and materials, but I, I think actually reaching out uh, to and, and being proactive about contacting different uh, queer groups in the communities that you serve, whether you know, if you're a school library and there's, you've got a you know, uh, queer student alliance um, on, you know, in the school, or if you are an academic library and reaching out to the various student groups, the public library re reaching out to uh, groups in the community and say, hey, we would like to partner with you on finding the best ways to serve you. What does that look like? And invite them into a conversation. Uh, because I think a lot of times uh, programs and, and outreach that uh, isn't successful for any group is when we decide what they need. Uh, so actually asking people what they want and saying, how can we best be uh, of service um, and finding out uh, is, is a way to build the relationships that then will just inform um, how we can uh, make sure that we are collectively working together to, to help them be full parts of the community. That's a really great point, Mark. We're also a vital educational resource uh, in communities. Uh, there are a lot of them. I happen to live in one where um, comprehensive sex education, abstinence first to abstinence only curriculum. Uh, we have a, an opportunity to provide education about healthcare and safety that queer people may not be able to get at school or at home. Yes, that's it's excellent. And I also wanted to kind of build on, I think, what has been mentioned a number of times and what Shannon had mentioned in particular in our talk, which is something that, that my own children have faced who are, who are biracial, uh, which is tokenism, uh, which is, and I think it really ties to Shannon's point of it's really all of our responsibility. In fact, um, the, arguably the better way to move forward is not to have the LGBTQI person take the lead, but rather... Um, and put it uh, on their on their shoulders exclusively, which of course for all of us can be exhausting, right? When you are the token and you're you're always uh, being asked to lead those efforts, I think that's also critical. And I appreciate Shannon breaking that up because in the end, uh, when we talk about inclusive, we really want embedded um, uh, EDI and not token EDI, 
by itself. So let's uh, move on to number four, which are how are members of the library uh, LGBTQI plus community shaping libraries today? What, uh, how are you all doing and what are, what are the roles of the community in, in taking the lead in shaping how libraries are gonna be in the future? I'll, I'll take a swing at that. Um, I think it's a great question. I think it's also very complicated um, because it's, it's very related to, I guess, trying to disentangle a lot of the, the, the changes in perspective that are happening across librarianship now, as well as archival science and, and museum studies and related fields. And it's sort of, for very smart people sort of guess at this, and, and I don't think I could do any better, but it does seem like we're, paying, uh, the attention that we're paying might be slightly different, right? So maybe a little bit more in tune to the people represented in our collections, a little bit more in tune to the the, my, the under traditionally underserved communities that might be coming into our institutions, more so than previous generations are. And maybe some of that is because more of us are LGBTQ+. Plus identified, maybe because more of us are, come from a variety of, of previously underrepresented communities ourselves. But I think just our presence in, in a room that makes decisions, I think makes makes a big change. I think our presence in, <laughs> in a staff room makes a big change, right? And it's sort of a, a I don't know if it's a running, it's right to say it's a running joke, but you know, if you have one person at a library come out, as um, you know, whatever identity they, they're coming out as, it's, it's very likely that other people will within the next year, um, because that just changes the environment and makes it. I mean, unless that first person has a terrible experience, it just really makes it um, easier for other people to do it. So it's almost, and again, it's not just LGBTQ plus, right? Like this is for for any number of communities, but just by having us around, just by having more diversity among any sort of given room or a group of people, just the presence itself seems to help. Um, I hope I hope that was coherent. I'm on mute. No, it's very good. No, it's great. That's a great point. Well, I want to give a shout out to the uh, Rainbow Roundtable of the American Library Association. Um, because it's it's a one way where collectively we uh, provide both advocacy for uh, ourselves within the association. Um, you know, this is the group that's responsible for having gender inclusive bathrooms at our conferences. Uh, and, and when conference services forgets to get the signs up, then we are the ones reminding them, no, we said this is a commitment that we're going to do. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we have a counselor who represents us on council and is making sure that when we are looking at issues uh, from the association, whether it's making statements on areas that are of importance to us or, or looking at policies across the association, that our voice is represented in those conversations. Um, and then for the, for the general library community, as well as for the, the general public that we serve, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is, uh, are the book awards and book lists, because sometimes it can be hard to find the materials if it's not coming up through your you know, traditional jobbers or, or vendors. And so to, to do the work and, and, and people say, well, I don't know what to buy. You know, I, I don't know how to serve this community. Oh, well, here's a list of 75 books that you could buy right now. Or if that's too much, here's the top three, you know, just, just trying to get something out there. Um, and, you know, kind of uh, speaking to, to Cassian's earlier point about connecting over history than to, to say, oh, look, let's look at, 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 this, at the representation of our community through the Stonewall Book Awards through all, all this time. Uh, and so but just by, by providing um, resources another way, and, and there are, uh, you know, there, there is also um, a toolkit that's called Open to All. Um, I will put the link in for that in the, in the chat as well that is about how to serve the LGBTQIA plus community in your library. And so providing those kinds of professional tools is a way that we can uh, make sure that we are collectively doing a better job of serving the community. Yeah, Martin, I wanna, I wanna echo that. In fact, that is why we're here today. So when I was looking for uh, keynotes and panelists to discuss this issue, uh, the round table uh, was what I was referred to. Right. And so kudos to all of you for uh, you uh, being willing to take the leadership to stand to, to speak on this issue, uh, because it was a, a little bit hard uh, to find initially uh, folks that were willing to 
can come together uh, for for this symposium. So thank you for your leadership and really, again, a perfect example of how the roundtable uh, really serves a purpose and kind of a nexus for uh, this kind of um, uh, discussion. So any other uh, thoughts on, on how all of you can change the world? Anthony, or Dr. Chow, there's a few questions in the Q&A that might be um, interesting for the group. Yeah, yeah, please feel free to, uh, if you like, if, uh, or I can. Let's see. I am, I am, uh, do you have a specific one, Shannon, you might want to speak to? I've been, I've not been keeping up. Sure. I was just going to, um, I think the first one in the Q&A from Anonymous is really interesting. Um, this person writes, we're ad advocating for the creation of an LGBTQ plus working group to review policies, recommend training, plan programming, et cetera. And we've gotten support in concept from upper management, but also heard concerns about how big the scope of the group's work would be and how staff are overburdened. Like a lot of systems, we have staffing shortages. Any thoughts on how to best make the case for the need to coordinate planning LGBTQ plus services and support on a system-wide level? Um, I think this would be a great question to hear from a variety of perspectives. Yeah, great point. So to the panel. <laughs> it's probably pretty important um, to make sure that before staff volunteer for this, job to have some of those questions kind of ironed out and and to have someone on more of a managerial level who is going to be the liaison for that group to the management because that may put them in kind of a vulnerable position if they are advocating for their own identity um but i do not want for your frontline staff to end up in a situation where on top of all of the challenges that are part of their day-to-day -day work, they are also sort of fighting their identity on both sides um, to the public and to the library. Uh, I, I, don't, I think it is a great idea. Um, we have a pride committee at our library and we, our original impetus for this was to plan um, some LGBT plus um, themed programming uh, for our to go along with our summer slate of programs. Um, it was very successful. We're going to keep it. Uh, however, reviewing policies is kind of a different thing. I, I would worry about having them get really deep into it and then always be told, no, it is not the right time and, and get very discouraged in, in a way that you know, maybe they're able to ignore the discouraging aspects of those policies right now, but once they have formulated a plan for how it could be better uh, to be shot down might be pretty demoralizing. That's a really great point. Administration definitely has to be uh, in, in, the, in that uh, formula for making sure that it's uh, supported and also uh, institutionalized in many ways. Yeah, I would just add, um... That yes, to everything everybody said, and that sounds that sounds really, really important and very, very difficult. So I definitely I, I wish you the best of luck. I, the only thing that I would add is, um, it, whatever work can be done for scoping at the beginning, uh, right? So it's, it's easier to sort of build on early successes. So if there's if there's relatively low hanging fruit, I think is what people say. Um, if you can if you can get that, um, and then sort of show the benefit of, of spending time on this, especially with co uh, outside community um, support, right? So if you have patrons who are like, oh, wow, this is so much better. And you can leverage that to continue the, the momentum for, for a project like that. I think uh, potentially that, that would be helpful. And also throw out that I think that's part of that um, has to be, um, action right so i think that we're we're addressing this in california with school libraries as far as well what does this actually look like and i think uh, martin had mentioned um you know a number of different uh 
uh, resources and services that are really um, considered best practices. And so arguably, I'm a big fan of checklists, right? So it could very well be, uh, what does this look like? And, uh, and uh, leadership not only embraces it, but actually um, you know, uses it in a way, as a way to kind of self-assess. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, ALA accreditation now is very much tied to equity, diversity, and inclusion. But our response back to them is, we need a few more metrics as far as what that actually looks like. Uh, and I think that uh, it is definitely a move in the, in the right direction. So. Uh, and I'll, I'll just chime in uh, one more time, if you don't mind. Before yeah, please. We move on. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to say that it was just pointed out to me that uh, low hanging fruit has uh, potentially uh, uncomfortable uh, racist undertones in history, and I didn't realize that. Um, I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my apologies too. I did not realize that either. So, um, so I think uh, the next question, now that uh, Shannon has pointed me in the right direction, I was looking at the chat, <laughs> but it's the Q and A chat. Um, is this is from Caitlin? So, as a queer person, I prefer using the word queer rather than LGBTQ plus in displays and other mentions of the queer community for the library, what should we be using? LGBTQ, queer, either way, either way what does the panel think? Uh, I would just say that, you know, we were talking about language before and how language is always challenging. I think this is whether it was, well, do we use folks or y'all or uh, mix is something that I've also seen as an option, but I don't think it's been widely adopted yet. And it's more for written rather than, than verbal communication. Um, I, I think the fact that we have so many letters in the current uh, usage uh, reflects the diversity of the community. And so one way for displays uh, at least is to kind of take a world word cloud approach where you can use words in different ways kind of around it and, and change out the terminology. Uh, and I think that as time goes by, uh, you know, queer in particular is, is losing some of its edge that I, I have some colleagues who are my age, I'm 50, who are still upset by queer. I, I'm using queer more often have for, for quite some time. Um, but uh, so I think that that, that may uh, begin to change. But at this point, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the tendency has been, let's use more of the acronyms because that is seen as being more inclusive um, and, uh, but I, th I think for displays, you could then make sure that the, that the materials or some of the imagery uh, calls out different parts of our community uh, so that we can uh, try to highlight as many identities as possible. Um, so that's, that's just one idea. Um, I think that this is an incredibly difficult question. <laughs> and um, from my perspective is that it, I just, read my audience, right? If I'm putting together a library display for the general public, I use LGBTQIA to Spirit Plus or LGBT or some variation thereupon. If I'm in queer space, I use queer. Um, I think that it's like a lot of the questions I've seen in the chat, a very difficult and complicated answer that people have very long conversations about. And I think a lot of it's situational. I will say that I do use the word queer for myself. I would lean against putting it on a library sign. I do not think it is bad to do, but I think there's um, there are still a lot of divided opinions and probably some confusion from you know the the people uneducated on these issues about you know is that a slur? Um, is that okay to say? And not everyone would want to be called that word. And I try to be sensitive to that. Um, however. I really only put up signs that say LGBTQ plus anything um, during Pride Month or if I'm having a, like a, a specific program, we're having one later this year on um, queer mental health. Um, I, and then for Pride, it's easy. I just say Pride and it's a rainbow. And then um, I try to make sure that it is inclusive of all the various identities that could fall underneath that umbrella. And then all the rest of the year, there are going to be um, in LGBTQ plus inclusive titles on those displays. Um, but it's kind of like I had a babysitter who used to put uh, cream spinach in the pasta sauce so that you would just get vegetables and not ever have to think about it. 
Um, we put the we put books um, with various racial identities and sexual identities and gender identities in the displays all year, um, and and we do not point them out. They are just there for people to take and learn about. Yes, really, yeah. really go ahead, Shay. So oh, I think Melinda's point is great. Um, I was just going to say too, along with everyone else, um, I have mixed feelings about terminology. It's incredibly complex. Um, when I've spoken about intellectual freedom to librarians, I talk a lot about context and, and nuance. And one of the examples I use is the word queer. And so, you know, for me, it, it's a self-identifier. It helps me feel like part of a bigger community. But it's also been used as a threatening slur against me. Um, so context really matters. And I think Melinda's point, Melinda's explanation is a great um, illustration of how context matters. Pride plus rainbow, most people are familiar with what that means in the context of what that means. Um, so I think we can um, give a, a nuance into this to this question. Yeah, those are all really great, great points. And I think building on those from a, a BIPOC uh, perspective. So as an Asian American male, uh, it's my opinion that you uh, define yourself as you want to define yourself because there's always going to be someone else that's going to have a problem with you or what you have to say. So I think coupled with what uh, both Belinda and Cassie had said, of course, reading the room and being respectful at the same time. But I definitely, be, I'm a big believer in define who you, uh, who you are and label yourself as you want to label yourself. Uh, and then of course, read the room as far as making sure it's respectful uh, with those that you're around. Because I think ultimately, uh, uh, seeking anybody's approvals at a zero sum game uh, because ultimately someone's going to have a problem with you. And uh, again, being someone uh, that is racially, you know, easy to identify, I found that to be the case. There's not, there's not a thing I could do. If someone is a uh, racist towards me, it's not my problem. It's theirs. So. I just um, want to uh, quickly yeah. add on that with the rainbow round table, that's a, that's a new name for us because we had been the GLBT round table, which reflects a lot of institutional history. And it took us years, literal years to come up with a new name. And, and it was down to actually LGBT round table or rainbow round table. Uh, and I, the vote went to rainbow. People who I talked with about it were like, we, we just want to pick something that could be a little bit more stable because um, quite honestly, the acronym keeps changing as our evolving understanding improves and, and gets better. And they didn't want it to keep changing the name of the round, round table. And we still have some folks who are upset about it. Uh, so I wanted to go for Friends of Dorothy, but no, no one can. That way we could have been Fodort because there's also a government documents round table <laughs> called Fodort. And I thought Fodort would be great, but I was voted down. <laughs> I think that was my, but that's, that's fun. I like that. <laughs> Uh, let me uh, let me uh, paste a question that Liz had. So I think um, this will be for the panel. Uh, so Liz says, uh, my hometown public library system has said they will no longer allow Black History or Pride Month displays. Is there a way to challenge that other than grassroots community groups? There is one group against it, but they don't have much traction. So what does the panel think? What what can they do? So I'm going to put my hat on as uh, most uh, as of uh, yesterday, I was chair of the Intellectual Freedom Committee for the American Library Association. Um, and this is uh, something that's been coming up. Um, uh, a part of the answer to this specific question is uh, what your policies say about um, what sort of programming is allowed. Um, if this is an internal policy that is what library sponsored program can be, um, if they uh, do not have um, I mean, well, if they have specific uh, things against being able to have programming related to Black History Month or, or uh, Pride Month, then um, you, this is uh, it's likely not constitutional. Um, and then it would have to be, and, and there would be legal action that could be taken about that. And I say that knowing that that's expensive, um, but that could be something to talk to the ACLU about and talk to your state chapter of the ACLU about. 
Um, if this is a decision that they've made that's for outside groups not being able to do anything, that's almost definitely going to be unconstitutional. Uh, and again, so uh, my answer again would probably be ACLU in terms of, in terms of that. Um, I would recommend that um, you contact the Office for Intellectual Freedom. It's something that Shannon mentioned before, uh, because we have had, we see a number of libraries around the country um, who are making, I will, I will characterize them as knee-jerk reactions uh, to concerns about this. And some of them are, are, are either overriding existing policy or they're adopting new policy that is questionable, if not un unconstitutional. Um, and OIF has been really good about being able to provide advice as to ways to use some pressure. Um, I'm aware of uh, a, a library in um, my former home state of Colorado that changed its policy and uh, one, uh, and, and, and to my personal opinion, not to the better in terms of saying that they were going to avoid controversial programming. Well, who defines what controversial is? Anything you just don't want to deal with, uh, and that includes us. Um, and one way that they've gotten some traction is that they uh, talk to the local independent paper and they start to make some noise about it. And, and I would say uh, if you want to uh, go that route, um, then uh, you, you can do that. Uh, I will also note that that um, so, so one of the library workers involved no longer works for the library. Um, and so it can be at risk to your own financial well-being to make a fuss. Um, and I, I mentioned it in the chat earlier, but there is something called the Merit Humanitarian Fund uh, that does provide direct financial assistance to library workers who are either standing up for intellectual freedom or because they're being discriminated against for who they are. Uh, and so that would be, uh, you know, they, and, and they can provide, a, uh, you know, short-term assistance. Um, so that is... Um, uh, that's just one, one thought, but the policy thing is tricky. If an organization has a policy that they're not following, they are opening themselves up to lawsuits. And that's a good thing to bring up to the board of trustees because the boards don't like lawsuits. So, so that's something else to just keep in mind. That's a great point, Martin. Thank you. Other thoughts from the panel? I guess I... I wonder, um, and the question asker did not specify, do they work for this library? Um, I, I would be interested to know if there is a feeling from the other staff that they are against this because it is possible that by banding together, they could have more power than any one of them is gonna have on their own um, without a coalition of like-minded people who believe that federally recognized Black History Month is something that we should be participating in. I do not know how far you're going to get, sadly. Yeah, Liz uh, responded, she says, I do not work there, but I work in another city in the same state. Yeah, so that's a great point, Liz. Yeah, sometimes if there are um, community members who are objecting to this change in policy you know having them speak to the library and say look i heard you're getting rid of black history month displays and actually i find those really valuable especially if the library is doing it out of a knee-jerk anticipatory sort of pose having patrons come in and say no wait this is actually really useful that might change um go some direction towards changing the library's mind i also wonder um did they announce this policy change or is it something that they are quietly doing um, because it, it may also be valuable to draw more attention to it. Um, if it, if what they want is to avoid negative attention, maybe call some negative attention to, to this decision. Cassie, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was gonna echo um, what Melinda and Shannon were both saying is that I, I love a good grassroots movement. Um, I think that it sounds like there's opportunity to get more collective support for diversity and inclusion in the library. I think that you can start to reach out to different organizations. And I think a really helpful thing that some, some groups in my city do is that they will write like a outline for a letter or an email that you can send to certain people to basically threaten them with public embarrassment <laughs> um, over this. So I do think that um, there's just a lot of opportunity to just reach out to people and kind of get other people to support um, 
there's other people who share that opinion. And if you can engage in some sort of collective action, even from a grassroots level, I think that that's valuable. That's a great point. Thank, thanks, everyone. Let me, uh, I'm going to paste another question here. So this is from Grace uh, Huffman. So she says, as a newly graduated MLS student and LGBTQ plus identifying librarian, has there been any discussion about how librarians who are being persecuted and at times even prosecuted for advocating inclusion of these materials and these programs stay safe, especially as legislation gets worse? Yeah, um, notice the, the, Mark, please go ahead. I was gonna say, I, I, I did put an answer to the chat in this one. In the Merit Fund, I'll just repeat again because it's always worth repeating. Um, uh, and then I'll defer to Shannon. I was just gonna say, notice we all pause for a moment because this is a, a tough question without a really resoundingly great answer, unfortunately. Um, you do have to protect yourself first. And you have to protect your livelihood. You know, if you've got kids and a mortgage and a car payment, um, you've got tough decisions probably. Um, I, I understand and I respect that. Um, and I also know some people who've had to walk away from the library world because it wasn't inclusive and safe. And I respect and understand that too. Um, I think the Merit Fund is a great, um, a great solution. Talking to the Office for Intellectual Freedom is a great solution. Um, Melinda earlier mentioned banding together with coworkers, so you're not um, one person standing alone, but there's three or four or ten of you um, that can make a difference. Um, and speaking from a professorial point of view, um, I've had students reach out to me and say, hey, I'm encountering this problem in my library. What do you think? What what should I do? And I'm always happy to give feedback and guidance. Um, I, not that I always have the best solution, but um, reach out to your mentors, your allies, your professors, if you still are in touch with them and seek some um, guidance and support. And I'll say from a leadership standpoint, oftentimes we talk to people about um, job satisfaction. So another thing to look at is um, if in fact uh, you are not supported, the question you do have to ask yourself is if, if it's a good fit, right? If, in other words, how, how much longer do you want to work in an environment uh, that is so uh, restricting? Um, and then the other thought is, I think just making the attempt, even if it's shouted down, uh, may draw enough attention to the issue to have won anyway. Um, and, and the reason why I bring that up is because I think outside of outwardly and explicitly supporting a particular uh, type of person or people, um, I think it also sends a message to those people that you care, right? And I think that oftentimes libraries serve, most importantly, that intimate relationship between people in the community that want resources, uh, and it's a, almost a one-to-one -one quiet interaction. So I think that in some ways, even I, I would definitely always say raise a fuss, uh, even if you're shouted down, we could still have an article written about it. Uh, and, and I think that alone sends a message out to the community that you're there for them, right? And I think. Uh, you know, and I think that's my my personal experience with my my son who's transitioning to to my daughter is that in in, uh, in her K through 12 experience, um, she didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what was happening in the library is one of the really only places in which um, maybe there could have been more support uh, because um, of that content, right, of that availability of content uh, when she needed it. So. There's a question in the Q&A that we should address. Um, yes, please, let's talk BIPOC, let's talk intersections. LAS is still struggling to find folks who are not white hetero cis. How can we as an organization be open to having more diverse people join our ranks? Um, this is a super important question. This is really goes to the heart of serving your community, representing your community. Um, I think, um, one controversial answer that I'll give is um, maybe we need to not always be requiring, re requiring an MLS degree to start. Um, maybe we um, hire folks who don't have the degree 
and if they want to be invested in the in this as a career, then we help fund the degree. Um, tons of tons of programs let you go part time, one or two classes a semester, so it doesn't have to be an exorbitant cost. Um, that's a little controversial, um, especially coming from somebody who teaches the degree. Um, but I think that's that's one step we can take. I'm very excited to hear what other folks have to say. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Be very intentional about the amount of education that you're requiring. Um, if you do not actually need someone to have that level of education before they start, um, requiring it is just keeping people from applying who might otherwise do well. Uh, I think being intentional about how much and what kind of experience you want people to have because an unpaid internship is something that a, a relatively small portion of the population is uh, able to afford to do, uh, to work for free for six months or a year. Um, if we're talking about, um, you need to have a sense for how people can move up. Um, I know a lot of libraries will hire just about anybody to be you know, their frontline customer service workers um, but then there is no opportunity for even the very, very talented, very, very skilled uh, among that staff um, to move into more respected, more prestigious, higher paying roles. Um, I have another controversial answer, which is that we need to pay people more. Um, I interviewed for a library that was paying uh, $13 an hour for a degree librarian for 37 and a half hours a week. And the only way someone could afford to work at that library is if they have family money or they are married to somebody who makes a lot of money. Uh, there is just no way for someone without any of those advantages to break into the field. And um, yeah, so, I mean, we need to look at our hiring practices and our work practices first. And then there are certainly a lot of cultural changes that I'm sure a lot of places have to make uh, in order to be more accepting of people who are different from the people who they have historically hired. Um, but there are very practical uh, barriers preventing people from getting in. So I just uh, finished my doctorate last year and my dissertation was on understanding the experiences of academic librarians of color. Um, and, and so, uh, which, and you can read my positionality statement about what it was like for, you know, a, 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 a cis white gay man to be writing about, uh, the experiences of people of color. Um, and it's trying to use my, my, uh, positionality and my privilege to center the voices, uh, of others. Um, so using critical race theory before it became controversial, but now I'm excited that it was controversial. Um, and it's available open access. I just put the link in the chat, but some of the recommendations I want to just uh, echo what has been said about, you know, in the chat, someone talked about mentoring is something that's really important. Uh, I think that we also need, and, and uh, you know, one, one of the recommendations that came from my participants was hire more people of color. Uh, and, and, you know, that sounds simple, but it's also hard because it's not just about, it's, it's, what I found in my discussions with my participants was it wasn't so much that it wasn't a welcoming place uh, from the outside, but it wasn't, uh, they, they just didn't want to stay. Uh, and so it's having to change the climate. Um, and one way that we change the climate is to talk about issues, to talk about race. Uh, we, we, we talk about equity and inclusion and diversity, but uh, actually let's talk about justice. Let's talk about anti-racism. Let's talk about uh, actually making changes instead of saying, uh, you know, well, we, have to, we have to talk about the corrective work that we need to do instead of just saying, if we just open our doors and bring everybody in, everything will be okay. You know, there are systemic issues that we need to address. Um, another recommendation was to change uh, how we do LIS education. Uh, and, and part of that is, is to uh, equip all of our folks who are going through our, our, our programs with things like critical race theory or, or uh, other critical theory that allows us to examine uh, what we do and, and how we operate as a profession through the lenses of race, of gender, of, of orientation, uh, so that uh, people have the skills to see where the issues are and to start to work to dismantle those problems. 
Uh, and I also, you know, I just figured I might as well aim high. I think we also need to look at the core values of librarianship uh, and, and see that they actually reflect what we're doing now. So, so, um, so I think that in order to, uh, to have people want to be here, we need to um, we need to look at what is making our our profession a place for where where folks who are not uh, the who are not the you know the the, the majority uh, don't feel comfortable staying, um, and so and some of that is 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 doing some of that work uh, to talk to find out what those issues are. So um, I I'm, I'm hoping that that's something that we can be changing. Um, uh, I feel, but we've also been trying to work on this for, for decades without a lot of success. Uh, and, and so I, um, we, we, we need to look at the fundamentals. Um, I'll just pop in to say, Martin talked about intentionality and um, you, know, you mentioned it briefly and that's something that um, everybody can do. For example, I've made a pledge now that I have tenure and I have some seniority. I will only do collaborative work if it includes a junior scholar and or a person of color. And so I'm very intentional about seeking out those relationships and offering to mentor people rather than waiting for somebody to say, hey, I need a mentor. Would you do it? Boy, that, that's that's hard to do, right? Um, so offering mentorship, offering informal guidance, um, just being a, a voice that people can turn to, someone that people can turn to. And this isn't meant to toot my own horn at all. I was helped by tons of people along the way. I'm just trying to pay it forward. Um, but just to say that those of us who are in more senior positions can be really intentional about um, trying to break patterns that are not um, healthy for our profession. So all great points. Any, uh, I've got a lot of thoughts, but any other thoughts from the panel? I, I would just jump in just to say something real fast. And this is maybe to look at it from a different angle. Um, so I'll just bring up the question again to be sure. So Monica, I, I appreciate the question. And I appreciate the way that you worded it, right? So you, we're talking about struggles to find folks who are not white heterosis. So I'm white. Um, and so the, this this is this is coming from from my positionality as a, as a white trans individual, and I know it'd be compounded if I wasn't white. I don't think I would. I didn't come out until several years into librarianship, and I think I would have left if I had entered at all. If I were out as trans, I don't think that the mentorship. Shannon, to go back to what you were saying a little bit, I don't think the mentorship that I did get would have been as forthcoming. And I kind of, I'm, I'm just sort of hesitant to think about libraries being a place where we, and that Monica, this isn't about you or your question, but it's sort of more about conversations that I see out in the field about, the, it makes me a little uncomfortable sometimes to think about libraries being a place where we ask ourselves, like, how do we get more people of color? How do we get more LGBTQ plus folks? Because I just don't feel like we're really we've done the work yet. And I feel like we're putting a lot of people in really unfortunate positions and situations. And ultimately, I think I will leave librarianship because of my positionality. Um, it's, a, it's a really unfortunate thing to be true. And it's an unfortunate thing to say out loud, especially in a setting like this. But I mean, it's just, and, and it, I know it depends on where you are, uh, both in your institution and your leadership role and in your region, et cetera. But, um, it's just such a tough question. And I just wonder to what right we have to be encouraging people to join us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so for being so candid. Go ahead. If I may follow on, Sophie, uh, you know, what I, when I started my study, it was trying to look at both current and former academic librarians of color to see if there was something that shifted because there have been previous studies that look at current experiences. Um, and a lot of things that were named as these are things that could help with retention, like mentoring and, and, and changing, uh, you know, a, a, a more aspect on uh, having more, trying to change the culture. Um, all of those things uh, in large part happened for the folks who ultimately left. All they did is it let them stay a little longer. So it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't change it enough to make it, to fix it. It just let them endure a little bit longer before then they were tapped out. So your, your, your experience resonates with theirs. Uh, and uh, I, and it, it, it's, it, I, and that's something that we need to know 
uh, and that all of us need to know that this is what, what when, 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 if, if we are in a minority, then this is what we're, this is the experience that, that, that we're just going to churn through people. Uh, and that is not uh, for a profession that's supposed to be all about helping each other. That doesn't seem like the right way we should be going about it. So I'm just that. I'm sorry. No, that's a great point. Jesse. And I think that like um, a lot of organizations, you know, put diversity in their values, but are not willing to square with the fact that if you legitimately value diversity, you are going to have to do a lot of uncomfortable searching. And also you might have to really significantly change things structurally. I think that for a lot of organizations, um, you know, they think that diversity can be something that's passive or it's its own department that they kind of sequester off and they don't want it to touch other areas. And if you like truly value diversity and inclusion and justice, then you will fundamentally have to change the structure of your organization because there's no one simple answer or one simple easy thing that you can do that will make people join your organization and want to stay in your organization at great personal cost. Um, yeah, so I think it's very uncomfortable and I think it's definitely worth doing um, in the long term. Well, excellent. Um, so I'm going to approach it from a slightly different way, which is uh, going to the fact that we are, I think, are more similar than we are different. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is because when we, when we think about diversifying the field, having a lot of discussions, both at the uh, librarian level and also LS education level, one of the things that we must remember is that minority means there are not that many uh, and, and, and the numbers are hard to accomplish, right? So when we think about the Black and African-American community, there are so few Black and African-American librarians. Um, first and foremost, it's hard to get a Black and African-American librarian, um, and we should not just rely on that to be our litmus for supporting the Black and African-American community, right? Certainly, we want to focus on like a lot of libraries are doing a lot of large our urban libraries are focusing on vetting uh, uh, both certification and also scholarships within their workforce right and so that's happening certainly in the bay area where uh, the requirement of the MLIS degree is questioned because obviously there are a lot of professionals that do uh, mark uh, and would would be representative of the community so but I do know in talks with ALA um, in discussions with education and, and diversity and inclusion, one of the things that they have, they as in the people that we're working with uh, that work at ALA, they have come to the conclusion, or at least one of the focal points being that we must also embrace the fact that, that largely DEI is going to be talked in a white context, right? That is white librarians serving mostly white patrons. And there's nothing wrong with that in terms of the, de the, the demographics of that library situation. So I think it's a very important point. In other words, it goes back to what Shannon said, it's all of our responsibility to be teaching DEI. And so regardless of whether you look like me or not, uh, I think we have much, many more similarities than we have differences. And also it is our responsibility to understand what those differences are from an authentic view. So if I cannot have a Native American librarian, uh, then, then what I need to do is make sure that I have Native American uh, members of the community and librarians speak to the authentic view of what they are dealing with and what I can do to help them, right? Uh, and so I think that's also very important. Uh, the other thing is that like all complex problems, we must have multiple solutions. So I think everything we're saying here is correct. <laughs> we, sh we should pursue all of the different avenues. Uh, and, and I think that ultimately um, I do see progress uh, as difficult um, as it is. Sophie, um, to be selfish as an LS educator, uh, should I, I hope that you will stay in the field because uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, metaphors that we've created here at this, the iSchool is called the iWarrior which is basically librarians and the need to be information warriors is more important than ever, 
right? As far as all the things that are happening uh, and all of the reasons why librarians must uh, change people's worldviews, be controversial and be supportive across the board, uh, which is, which is uh, sadly controversial to some people uh, in our communities. And so, but I think that's a good thing. Uh, and I think that ultimately, um, like when you look at school libraries, oftentimes the library is the only place in which, say, lower socioeconomic children can have access to the same material that middle class and up have, right? So, so I wanted to say that. And then lastly, let me leave you with a, a really, a, I think, a transformational conversation I had with Crosby Kemper, who is the director of IMLS. So I asked him this question just a couple of days ago. Uh, what do you think we need to be doing to be uh, more responsive to DEI. And he, he said something that I think was pretty phenomenal. He said, so the first thing he thinks we should do is always remember the people and communities that we serve and to also look at it as um, a holistic perspective. So when I talk about uh, the Black and African American community, Latinx community, uh, I must also talk about them in the holistic view of, let's say, Kansas City or San Jose. In, in other words, it's not just talking about that community, but talking about uh, the fabric of all of the different perspectives and cultures and races that are in that specific area. I really like that point because I think that also avoids tokenism, right, which is that, you know, I'm Asian, so I must speak for all Asians. No. Uh, and to be honest, I don't even know what that means, right? So I, I grew I was born and raised in the Deep South. My, my wife is Dutch Irish. My kids are mixed race. What does that even mean exactly, right? And so I think that's one of the reasons why I'm such a proponent of focusing on our similarities. And obviously, we do have cultural value value traits, but to make, but I think it's a mistake to say that's ubiquitous across all Asian Americans, or it's, a, it's, it's ubiquitous across any particular type of community. So, uh, so anyway, I think this is a great conversation, uh, and certainly DEI should be across the threshold. And, and I think. Going back to uh, the person who asked the question, and I'm sorry, it's uh, Monica, uh, you, I think, will be happy to know that, again, ALA accreditation has challenged all of LS education to say it needs to be across the board. It needs to be across the workforce, it needs to be across the curriculum, it needs to be across the metrics, it needs to be across, uh, and I think that is exactly the right way to approach it as long as we start to at least come up, come up with some operational definitions. And by the way, that was the response of all, all LS education programs, where we said, okay, we need to put some metrics behind this, right? Uh, because otherwise we're gonna interpret it maybe too, too uh, differently, so. But anyway, uh, with that being said, I wanna leave some time, so anyone feel free to ask additional questions, but I wanna leave time for every one on the panel to have maybe some final thoughts. So as we kind of move into, uh, the turn of the hour, um, I'd love everyone just to have a few concluding thoughts. So, um, and I'm just gonna go with maybe the popcorn method. So I'm gonna start with Melinda and then Melinda, feel free to hand it off to uh, whoever you would like afterwards. So Melinda, uh, go ahead and share your final thoughts. Okay, um, I, I'd like to start by saying, uh, I, I think we all came with a lot of questions about how to support uh, queer communities. Um, and, and I think that those are really good questions to be thinking about and to continue thinking about after you leave today, uh, because I have really never met a queer person who had too much support. Um, I don't think that person exists. We are not there yet. <laughs> so anything that we can be doing um, to add on to that, whether that is, you know, education of our allies and community, um, providing uh, you know, good and accurate and affirming uh, health information to people, providing them uh, fluffy romance novels that show that someone like them can have a happy ending too. Um, we really, I, I like that we are making progress across all of those things. There is still a lot of work to be done and I'm glad everyone is working on that. Okay. Thanks, Melinda. Um, uh, Martin or Sophie, go ahead. Oh, it's okay. I thought you said Sophie, Melinda. If not, I apologize. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, uh, fantastic. Well, thank you for letting me part of this. I think for closing thoughts, I, I would like to wrap it back up to something that we almost maybe started with, maybe at the very beginning, which which was building on uh, Shannon, your um, your emphasis on examples and being able to see ourselves in the collection and thank you again for your presentation which i very much enjoyed um and i think like a setting like this 
um, especially if we were actually able to see each other. Um, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to have the example of people who care about this, these type of topics and are really coming together because now is just, it's just a very challenging time. I think to be a librarian, like at all, but then, you know, on top of that, you, you pile on all, all the different identities and then the, the different challenges, um, legislative and uh, <laughs> proud boy related, et cetera. And, um, and, and it's just, it gets really bad. So I, I do appreciate being here. And I think, and I, I think that's what I wanted to leave with is that the, every chance for community building and every chance for finding more examples is just really powerful. I'm going to popcorn it over to uh, Martin. Now, I'm going to ask you to when I was first asked to be on this uh, panel, my response was, but I don't like, this isn't my area of work. Uh, you know, it's, I, I, I can speak as, uh, as a gay man who works in libraries, but uh, well, I will say that my, the, the one citation of mine that has the most, uh, or, or the one uh, piece of scholarship I've done that has the most citations is actually something that was from my library school days about meeting the information services needs or the information seeking behavior of the gay and lesbian community of Denver, Colorado in the 90s. Um, boy, it has not aged well. And I certainly learned how to be a better researcher since then. And so, um, you know, so part of it was recognizing that while it's not uh, that serving the queer community in libraries is not the focus of my work, it is something that I care about deeply as a member of the queer community. And so trying to think about ways that, that I can represent wherever I am um, and, and uh, weave it in so it's, we're not just um, uh, relegated to a Pride Month display, uh, but to be able to surface those questions uh, and to, to raise the issues uh, whenever I'm in the room. I think that's something that, you know, Sophie, you said before about, you know, it's important for us just to be there. Uh, and so um, um, so I would just encourage everybody um, uh, for all the groups that you represent to be there uh, because you are in the room now. Uh, and so when you're in the room uh, to use that space to speak up and I will pass it to Cassie. Um, I also wanna thank everybody for um, letting me be a part of this and also having some really wonderful insight that is valuable. Um, and I guess my closing comment is that um, sometimes, you know, like being queer at work can feel very vulnerable, but also like I'm very honored and privileged that I've been able to be in workspaces that are as safe as they can be, I think sometimes, and that I've had um, some confused but trying their best <laughs> colleagues. And also I am just, um, just think that we should also be very excited and share sharing this space and knowing that there's, you know, a few hundred people who are willing to have this conversation with us. It kind of makes being like a rural queer person in a library a little bit less lonely sometimes. So thank you. I'll and just I'll add that no. I figure you're going to pass it to me since I think I'm the last one. <laughs> um, I just want to, again, like others, thank um, everyone for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Chow, for this opportunity. And thank you to all the um, participants for sitting through the symposium and um, participating, asking great questions and being a part of this. Um, it's been really fantastic. Um, I'll just reiterate the final points for my presentation, which um, I think will be, um, we can share with um, registrants. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, but it was um, be intentional about being inclusive and um, incorporating LGBTQ community, communities and individuals in your space, in your library. Um, remember that inclusivity can be life-changing for folks, um, even life-saving for some people. And then um, that sometimes it takes some courage to be a librarian, but there's also a lot of joy in doing the library work and bringing new things to your community and representing uh, the people of your community. Um, and um, there's joy in being a queer librarian too, so. Well, I just wanna thank everyone on the panel. I wanna thank all of the attendees. Um, we were going to have we we're going to have a full transcript uh, of these proceedings. 
uh, as well as the recording uh, and also a summary. Uh, so uh, look forward to that. The slides will be available. We're going to put it uh, on uh, our website. Uh, so also special thanks to Alfredo, Iori, and the entire staff for their tireless uh, work, as always, to make uh, making this event possible. Um, and I just wanted to say, uh, as a new administrator um, being pulled from the ranks, uh, Shannon, of, of uh, uh, being a faculty member, uh, something that uh, my former chancellor uh, told me, uh, uh, Frank Gilliam, who's African-American, um, when we worked together during the George Floyd um, uh, murder, if you will, and he was born in North Carolina. So when we, when we looked at each other, I was the uh, chair of the faculty senate then, he told me and urged all of the campus to just do something. So whatever it is, just take some action. So um, I challenge all of you all and certainly uh, you leaders out there uh, to do something uh, and, and to certainly, I think, apply equity, diversity, inclusion uh, across the board. Uh, that in fact, it's the majority of people that are not in the particular minority group that must stand for those that are otherwise being um, victimized or treated poorly. So um, again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, our next symposium will be the Hispanic Heritage Month in September uh, and um, have a wonderful day, uh, rest of your day, uh, regardless of time zone. Uh, and again, the full recording proceedings and slides and transcript will be made available shortly. So anyway, have a great day. Thank you so much.